God wouldn't place before us an impossible task or challenge. He would not inspire us to abandon our fears unless that were possible, unless it were doable, unless it were achievable. Good morning. Ah, works. Excellent. Fantastic. Never doubt Gwyn's expertise on the PA stuff. You might have been looking around the congregation this morning, you might be thinking, there's a lot of people not here. You're correct. They're not here. They're down on the beach. It's the annual beach party for the kids, so... Uh, all the children are down there this morning and some of their mums and dads are with them too and a big chunk of the junior church staff. So don't worry, you won't miss it all. They're down there till about two o'clock. So if you want to charge down after the service, you can catch them for an hour or so before they all go home and you can get sand in your toes as well. Okay. Exciting stuff, isn't it? I want to read a few verses from Isaiah 41. And I'm reading from verse 8. You, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners I called you. I said, you are my servant. I've chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I'm with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Maybe we'll just leave it there this morning. Do not fear, for I am with you. Don't be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I was not dramatically surprised to discover on doing a bit of research that there are something like 365 verses in the Bible that bring us instructions to resist fear. Almost, word for word, do not fear, appears throughout the Old Testament and throughout the New Testament, some voiced by our Lord himself, others by various writers of various books. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us, first of all, there's a Bible verse for every day of the year telling us that fear isn't going to get you anywhere, that it's, well, scary stuff, isn't it? So what does it tell you? It tells us, first of all, that overcoming fear is obviously of high importance. If anything is in this book, it matters. If it's mentioned more than once, it matters big time. And if it's mentioned something like 365 times, then it's obviously something of paramount importance to all people that breathe and live. Secondly, perhaps it suggests to us, because it's there so many times, that experiencing fear is probably a pretty common emotion that most men and women and boys and girls, indeed I dare to say all men and women, boys and girls, will experience probably on an increasing sort of number of episodes throughout our lives. Thirdly, it also means and probably suggests that there might be multiple causes and catalysts for our fear. Anything could trigger it. It could come for any reason, from any source, but there it is. Fourthly, it probably suggests to us, you're thinking, wow, if these are all these, all these points, it'll be done in two minutes. No, this is the introduction. You should be so fortunate. <laughs> but what it does mean is that God 
far better understands than we do the damage, the debilitation that it's empowering that fear brings to us. And fifthly, it definitely suggests to us that it doesn't actually have to be that way. For Scripture reveals clear remedies and protections against fear. We have had far better preachers than me during this year in particular couch on this subject. And that's not my specific aim, but my specific aim is to couch on this subject as to where we are in time uh, so far as our fellowship is concerned. Fears represent themselves often in the questions that we ask. The questions that we might speak out loud or the questions that float around in our heads. Things like, what if the new pastor does things differently? What if the new pastor can't be here straight away and Pastor Steve and Tess are on their holidays and there's no pastor yet? What if the elders are unable to find a new pastor? Well, we knocked that one on the head, thankfully. Just in time for this preach. <laughs> What's going to happen about the music? Pastor Steve features a lot in that. Where's that going to go? Will the new pastor be a good preacher? What if the church services change? And a million and one other questions that I haven't thought of, but you have, because they're going around in your head at this time. God knows your questions. He knows the fear that generates them. And his instruction concerning our fear doesn't come in anger, it doesn't come in disappointment, but it comes with love and with reassurance. It's going to be okay because... If he's allowed to take the helm of our lives... We're not going to end up on the rocks, but we're going to sail in new and exciting adventures. And so he urges us to disregard our fear because, firstly, we are assured of his continuing presence. Do not fear. I am with you. Not I was, or I used to be, or I might sometime be, but I am. It's he is the great I am. He always speaks in the present, the now. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. And so our key verse not only addresses our fears and questions them, it doesn't simply challenge us about our anxieties, albeit very gently and with great understanding, but it comfortingly underlines why that fear is actually unfounded and misplaced. He's with us. He is with us. We in this fellowship, well, I can't, but many of you perhaps can, can look back over the 36 years of his existence and more and can clearly, mis unmistakably see transparently clear and obvious concrete evidence that God's presence has overshadowed and enveloped this dear church fellowship even before its inception and certainly ever since. We've been experiencing that this morning. We haven't just been having a good time. We have been enjoying God's presence in this fellowship this morning. That's not new. That's not something that just suddenly happened. But we have enjoyed that for 36 years and more because that is the kind of God that he is. You know it. I know it. Each week we experience his presence. And not for a second has it ever departed. Never has God turned his back on us, even when we from time to time didn't quite get things right, made a bit of a mess of things. As pastors, we have that experience from time to time. I uh, missed it today. Didn't quite get it right, but he didn't, thankfully. He's committed to us for eternity and beyond. And so things are changing quite rapidly now. But just because things are changing, this is no time for us to turn our backs upon Far Christian Service Church, that church that he loves so dearly and is totally dedicated to. He's not going anywhere. Why would we? In the Old Testament, Naomi was faced with this great challenge 
finally, after the famine has subsided where she came from, I'm going to return home. And she said to her sister, to her daughters-in-law, you're not familiar with where I come from, and you're not familiar with my ways. You're not familiar with the geography, with the families, with the relatives. Why don't you just go back to the ones that you love? Orpah did. Naomi didn't. What are we going to do as these changes loom on us? In Deuteronomy 20 and verse 1, we read, When you go to war against your enemies and see horses, strangely, we were singing about them earlier on, and chariots and an army greater than yours, don't be afraid of them, because the Lord your God, who brought you up out of Egypt, will be with you. So he's not only telling us that he's going to be with us today, he's talking about that future. He will still be with us when tomorrow comes and the week after and the week after and the week after. Does the future seem scary? Well, it's usually the future that does. No point in being scared about the past. It's gone. And today we're alive and still breathing, so that's okay. We can just about keep our head about to provide water. Well, what about tomorrow? Oh. So is the unknown terrorizing you? Does it seem sometimes like your doubts are so much bigger than your confidence? Well, perhaps we should look at it with a different perspective then. The future lies, actually, as it always has, in God's hands. Can he be trusted? Well, I can't think of a single occasion that I've experienced or anybody else has ever told me about where he has let us down here at Farm Christian Service Church in our small existence. From a personal experience, I can look back in excess of 72 years and say the same, God has never let me down. Oh, if only the reverse were true. Isn't it true that the future has always been unknown? Whether we're talking about tomorrow or next week or next year, we do not know what's going to happen. And so often tomorrow takes us by surprise and all our plans go out of the window because something else crops up. It's always been true that the future has been unknown, but we found confidence to trust a God who has taken us upon this great adventure. And the future has never been unknown to him he still isn't. He still knows the future. Nothing's changed. It won't be the first time or the last time, I dare say, that any one of us will have doubts. The thing is, not to give in to them and allow those wretched enemies to seemingly grow in size and number. As he is today, he will be tomorrow. And the next time. And the next time. And the next time. Now is not the time to stand back and to hedge our backs as to what's going to happen in the future. Now's not the time to hide away, to relinquish our involvement. I'm not just quite sure what's going to happen. But actually, now is the time to throw in our lot more than ever before. Did we imagine that because the leadership is changing, that God's going to take his hand off the helm? Not for a second. Not for a second. There's that great verse in Isaiah 43 and verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Wherever we goes, God goes. Of course he does. He's in you. He's in me. He's with each one of us. Wherever we travel, there he is. Do difficult times lie ahead? Well, at some point, of course, inevitably. The prophet here didn't speak of if you pass through the waters, but when you pass through the waters. I am not for a moment suggesting that that's going to happen on the 1st of September, but they will come at some time. That's how life is. He speaks of times of crisis, not as if, but when. He promises that such times of testing won't destroy you, they won't damage you, they actually will grow you because he's there with you to make sure that they don't do you any harm. God's not leaving because the pastor and his wife are leaving and in fact they're not leaving. They're just changing their role. And now they will soon be taking up the mantle of leadership. I wonder what the school of prophets thought 
Were they driven to despair when suddenly they got the notion that Elijah, the great miracle worker, was going to be taken from them? What happened? God sent Elijah with a double portion of Elijah's spirit, the one before him. He knows what he's doing. It's not a question of, it's all downhill from now. What an insult to God, our captain. Such a statement is, isn't it, really? Good and great times lie ahead. How can you possibly know that, Steve Kemp? Because of this next Bible verse. Psalm 16 and verse 11. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. That sounds like good times to me. That sounds like a pretty good future to me. He promises presence. We can be more sure of his presence tomorrow and the next day than the certainty that the sun will rise again in the morning. It's that stone-cold certain. With his presence, he doesn't bring uncertainty or foreboding or trepidation, but did you read that verse? Explosive joy. And we've been experiencing some of that and singing about it this morning. And unending pleasures. Impending leadership changes don't adjust the divine promise in any way. Let's not waste time, energy, or our emotions with misuse. Fear is certainly a powerful and disabling force. In the midst of all our fretting and worrying comes the calm, assuring, divine proclamation, I'm still here, I'm still here. There's a sporting expression that says, never take your eyes off the ball. That came to me with very practical realisation at the age of 11. When I was standing at square leg and for the cricket team at school, at the junior school, we were in a very privileged position. By this time, I had migrated from the north back down to the south in Kent, and our school was privileged to be able to use one of the cricket grounds that actually the Kent County Championship team used to play on. It was just right opposite our school as it happened. And I was playing on this pitch. Not very well, but I was on the pitch. And we were so good that we'd beaten every team across the county on that particular season. And so we took on a team from one of the secondary schools. I don't remember much about it other than standing at square leg, which is sort of, well, it doesn't matter where it is. But anyway, <coughs> I just saw this batsman tackled the ball, and the next thing I was aware of, this ball was hurtling at me at ferocious speed, and actually, it was my duty to catch it. You know? And I don't know what happened, but I clearly must have taken my eyes off the ball, because the next thing I know, I was waking up on the ground, lying in a pool of blood, and then half an hour later, on my way to hospital, and uh, drinking my meals through a straw for the rest of the week, because my mouth was out here being duly stitched. Unfortunately, it didn't catch the ball, and it fell to the ground. It's not good to take your eyes off the ball. It's good to keep yourself focused on what God is saying, where he's directing us, and what he's doing us. You've run the race well. Don't get distracted now. Don't get distracted now. This is a key time. Let's ensure, I, I'd love to feel that every seat will be filled when the new pastor has his first Sunday with us and shares with us, just as I'm sure every seat will be filled when the current one preaches his last Sunday sermon with us too. Secondly, we're challenged to resist our fear because we belong to God and he looks after his own. Isaiah 43, verse 1, Do not fear for I have redeemed you, I have summoned you by name, you are mine, you are mine. God doesn't treat us like strangers, because we aren't, we never have been to him. We're not even just good friends. As Christians, as born-again believers, we are family, 
sons and daughters. We belong to him. He's our dad, our divine parent. And parenting, as those of you will know to your cost, is for life. As your children grow, so do the problems, so do the issues, so do the needs, so do their requests. He calls us by name, it says. That special name that recognizes special intimacy, the closest of relationships, no withheld secrets, no barriers, no distancing. I had the greatest admiration for our queen, Queen Elizabeth II, and um, she came to the throne just a year or two after I was born. And so, I, for many, she was the only sovereign I had ever experienced and until she ultimately died. But some of those precious things that just leap their way into the press from the palace, things like those intimate things, like Prince Philip used to love to refer to the queen as Lilibet. I wonder what God's special name for you and for me is. Precious thought, isn't it? Because we're his family. We're gods. Not slaves, but beloved children. Not one of a crowd, but precious choice, special sons and daughters and family matters to God. He invented it. I better move on and see the clock is racing me. It's a mutual belonging. It says in Song of Solomon 6 and verse 3, it speaks of, I am my beloved and he is mine. This lovely thought just dropped into my head. I was thinking about this. We often talk to him. We often talk of him as our God, my God. He is. He's my personal God and he's your personal God. But the other side of the coin is he often speaks about my Steve and this Steve and this Tess and and yet another Steve there in the congregations. He speaks of us as my Steve. What a lovely thought precious thought. He looks after his own. Mark 9 and verse 41, truly I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not reward, will not lose his reward in thy name because you belong to the Messiah. It's because we belong to him that we live and act the way that we do. There'll still be plenty of people out there in St. Anne's that need a cup of water that only you or I, your fellow Christian service church, can bring them. We do it because we are his, and that's how he is. We do it because we long for them to be his too. The mission remains the same. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. 1 Peter 2 and verse 10. I was privileged to be born in probably... I am biased, but probably is the most beautiful city in the whole of the UK, and that's the historic ancient city of York in North Yorkshire. My parents were both Kentish in origin, but my dad was actually pastoring a church at the time, and eventually I came along. So since that moment, although we migrated back to Kent a few years later, I've always thought of myself as a Yorkshireman as belonging to Yorkshire, hoping that the call would come out that one day I would qualify to play for the county team. I'm still waiting, and possibly have missed it. You know, but often our journeys take us along the M62. We often watch rugby and cricket in Leeds, and we have, I have family in Lincolnshire, and Mandy, my wife, has family in Lincolnshire. So that takes us up the M62, And as you go up that steep hill right on the edge of the Pennines, you might sometimes, if you've heard a very strange, loud noise and you don't know what it was from, it would be me. Just as we passed that white rose sign saying we had crossed into God's own country again. Okay. And I felt like I belong, I'm back home. The only thing that would ever entice me away from the seaside was maybe to lure me back into Yorkshire someday. We're encouraged to turn from our fear because we belong to him. And he looks after his own. And very quickly, I'll do this in two minutes. We are of inestimable value to God. Matthew 10, 31, don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. In Bible times, not really very different to today, sparrows were prolifically common. They were and they remain 
dull in colour, unattractive in plumage, and they can be purchased at rock bottom prices for next to nothing. For a batch of four or five, often an extra one would be thrown in free, free of charge, buy five, get one free, or whatever. In man's eyes, scarcely worth anything at all. But God's attention and concern, so intricate, so detailed, he spots even a solitary sparrow fall to earth in the last throes of its very short life. He cares. He places immense value even upon the lowly, dowdy sparrow and reminds each of his children that they're worth more than myriads of those tiny birds that seem to cover the earth and yet even one matters so much to him. We need not and should not fear because whatever happens to us as individuals or as a whole spiritual family here at Fowl Christian Service Church, we are far, far, far too valuable to God for him to allow us to go under or to fall apart. He has invested over 36 years of his time, his energy, his power, his strength, his love, his commitment, his protection, his provision, his guidance, his training, his admiration on this particular church fellowship and all who make that fellowship up. In fact, it all began before them when Fall Christian Service Church was just a plan, a scheme, a project in his great divine agenda for St. Anne's. Do we really imagine that he might turn his back upon us now? Of course not. It's inconceivable that after placing such devotion upon us vile Christian service church sparrows for such a long time that he should suddenly turn his attention elsewhere and lose interest. That's just not how God is. Not how he is. It's not with perishable things like silver or gold that you are redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. We're just moving into that time pre-football season where teams are beginning to play friendlies and they all leave. Uh, Leeds had a wonderful 3-0 win against Harrogate, which is completely meaningless because there's two leagues below them, but it's just a practice win doesn't mean anything in particular. But we're in that season where one club can buy another club's players and the bidding process starts and a player is valued according to his importance and according to his wealth. And one person might be bought for 5 million, another might be bought for 50 million, another even for 100 million or other. But so far as you or I concerned, there's no variance in the price. The price is total and absolute, and it's the blood of Jesus, and he paid it for you and for me. He invested everything in each one of us. That's how valuable we are to him. And in conclusion, in Philippians 4 and verse 19, he says, my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. I remember a day when I was waiting for the new car to arrive. And this was a new one. Never had a new one before. My first car cost 35 pounds. It was a beaten up Ford Anglia. 1959 job with three gears and it took me all the way from Gravesend in Kent to Blackpool. Didn't know I was going to end up living there one day at that particular time and it almost got me back home again as well. <laughs> but that's another story. <laughs> but when the day came to purchase a new car and this new car was imminent, I wasn't scared. I wasn't afraid. Oh no, what's my new car going to be like? Will it let me down? I'm leaping with excitement and joy at this gleaming machine standing at the end of the line. And just because new things are coming, it's not something to frighten us, but it's something to get so excited about. God wouldn't place before us an impossible task or challenge. He would not inspire us to abandon our fears unless that were possible unless it were doable, 
unless it were achievable. And we can do this and walk the pathway of confidence, assurance, and faith as we grip the truth that he will be with us every inch of the way, and he's invincible. We undeniably belong to God. He always has, always will look after his own. <laughs> that includes you and me. He's got lots of my Steve's and John's and Jenny's and Harry's and whoever around the congregation this morning. He places inestimable worth and value upon each of us and holds us close. So my challenge is, let's journey with him. See where it takes us, because it's going to be real good. Let's just pray together at the end of the service, shall we? So, Father God, we thank you for the great privilege of being part of your family. Lord, if there's no bounds of contentions, you are the most perfect father that there could ever be. We thank you for your faithfulness, for your love. Thank you for the value that you place upon each one of us. And we thank you for the joy of knowing you. Lord God, as we approach what is a brand new, unexperienced future, each one of us, over these next few weeks, we pray that we'll have the confidence to trust you and to walk with you through it to experience the adventure together. Amen. Amen. Praise God.